my name is Jason Gauci from Facebook AI. And um, really in this talk, I have two goals. Um, the first goal is to motivate sort of decision making and, and thinking about AI in, in sort of markets and in, in, in kind of making decisions, not just as sort of a signal processing mechanism, right? But actually as being an active agent in that decision, right? We're seeing a lot of problems of that nature up here, right? And I believe that this is really the next big frontier for you know, deep learning and for some of these really um, you know, large scale methods to kind of crack. That's sort of the next frontier. Um, I also want to save you the pain and suffering of having to build a large scale decision making system. So we have, a, we have an open source system. Um, feel free to download in GitHub, uh, you know, git clone the code and all of that. But even if you don't, you can kind of you know, walk through kind of this experience. And I hope to really kind of explain sort of the process that we've been going through for the past three years at Facebook AI. So I've been building recommender systems for about a decade. Um, I was at Google Research. Um, I worked on a project called Sybil that was um, basically a recommender system, a really large scale machine learning system over there. Um, I was at Apple for a little while and uh, spent the past three years at Facebook mainly focused in this area. So this is going to be a very different reinforcement learning talk than, uh, than, than you might be used to. Typically, you can imagine um, playing games, um, doing sort of classic control problems. But we're going to actually talk about you know, the big problems and challenges that are facing industry, at least several, several industries in this area, and how we can use reinforcement learning and bandits and some of these other technologies to sort of crack open a lot of these problems and take them to the next level. Um, I built a replacement for SSH. That sounds kind of crazy. It's like showing up at work and saying, I don't like this monitor, and just getting out a soldering iron and, and making your own. Um, but I was constantly going between different meetings. I was going to the shuttle, doing all of these things. And SSH would just keep locking up, because it's not meant to handle IP roaming and things like that. Um, so I asked for about two or three months to go and build an alternative. We have about 900 engineers at the company using it. What's that? Oh, thank you. Um, and I have a tech podcast where um, it's mainly geared towards students, but um, we love to you know, introduce tech ideas, talk about working in the Bay Area, things like that. So that's me. Um, the last time I gave this talk, I had an hour, so I'm going to do recommender systems in 10 minutes. Now, you know, more sort of brain power has gone into building these recommender systems than you know, the Apollo project. So I'm never going to do it justice, but I'm going to try my best. It typically has this sort of funnel, right? You start off with some type of retrieval step. So imagine you, know, you go to Amazon.com, boom, you hit enter, and there's a billion things they can show you. Right? They have to narrow that down very quickly. Right? So they're going to need what's called sublinear ranking. And typically, that involves some type of matrix factorization, some type of k-nearest neighbors uh, approach. Right? Once they've narrowed down the, let's say, 100 items or 1,000 items that they think would be the best candidates, and they've optimized for recall there, now they're going to turn on and optimize for precision. They're going to say, how can I pick the three items to show you out of this set of 1,000? Now I have, relatively speaking, a lot more time. Um, so typically, this comes down to event prediction. So they're going to predict what's the probability you add it to your shopping cart. What's the probability that you, um, you know, go all the way to the checkout page? What's the probability that you convert on the item? Right? And so this is where a lot of the you know, deep learning, image processing, NLP, all of these things come in here. And then there's the ranking phase. And this is where a lot of places are just doing black box optimization. And this is where I think the low-hanging fruit really is. That's where I'll spend most of the time uh, in this talk, right? Um, finally, the last phase is data science. So this is where retroactively you look at you know, what sort of product decisions um, you know, can we make based off of the feedback that we're getting from our customer base. How do we advance the product? Um, how do we, you know, what sort of values do we need to change? What sort of motivation should we have? Things like that. And I'm going to argue that recommender systems are actually control systems. Now, when I say control systems, it can sound like something that would, you know, be on the Death Star or something. But I'm thinking of it more from like a control theoretic point of view. So if you're familiar with, with Kalman filters or um, you know, even PID controllers, 
right? I'm gonna argue that recommender systems are really in that vein, right? Um, the retrieval and ranking are definitely control systems. Um, what we've done is we've augmented these control systems with the signal processing, which is what deep learning is really good at. So we've taken the, the, the thing that traditionally supervised learning and deep learning have been really good at, and we've found a way to mix it in with what is really a control problem, right? Um, after we've been running the system for a while, then we're going to do causal analysis. And that, that in my opinion, is the most important part, but it's also the hardest. Um, someone asked me on Quora, um, you know, will machine learning make data scientists obsolete? And the answer is no, absolutely not, right? Because there's, there's always an economic and a, and a philosophical aspect to, to anything you do. You always have to ask yourself, why am I doing this? And that, that's not gonna go away with deep learning. Now, what are the things that we're gonna try to achieve through our control system, right? With any of these problems, there's an there's a explore-exploit kind of phenomena going on here, right? You are getting new items, new content all the time, and you might not know anything about that content. Your prior might be pretty weak. So imagine, say, an ad system. It's very hard to extrapolate you know, a, a new product that's come out and that they start advertising from things that have happened in the past. And so there needs to be some way to handle that so that you're not just kind of recommending the same thing over and over again. You're not just showing you know, Gundam style to everybody. I don't know if that's still popular, but um, <laughs> you know, you're not just you know, reinventing that wheel. Um, also, it's really important to de-bias the model, right? So you can imagine this sort of vector of attack. Let's say um, you want to get a lot of advertising, but you don't want to pay for it. One way to do this is if you know somebody who um, let's say already has a very popular app. Let's say you know somebody at Facebook and that person tells you, we're going to release a new app. It's called FUBAR and it's gonna be the new Facebook and it's amazing and it's coming out tomorrow. So what you're going to do is you're gonna wait till FUBAR comes out. When FUBAR comes out, bang, you're gonna pay a bunch of people on Amazon Mechanical Turk to install FUBAR and then buy your game. And what that's going to do is that's going to set your game as the you know, related item or the suggested item whenever these billions of people go to install FUBAR, right? And that's way cheaper than paying for advertising. Trust me, I've looked at the data, right? Um, but that, that's not what we want, right? That's taking advantage of a system, right? So ideally we want a system that's sort of more self-healing that can sort of see these feedback loops and react accordingly. Now I'll talk a little bit about you know, again, I'm sure a lot of people have a background in um, you know, supervised learning, and they've seen sort of this deep learning revolution. And I'm gonna talk about how this is, what I'm talking about is a little different, right? Typically with classification, you're asking what questions. So if I show this ad, what will happen? If I recommend this product, what will happen, right? And the questions don't really, there's not necessarily a, uh, you know, a utility function there. It's, it's, int it's interesting to know if I show a skateboarding video to my grandma, what will happen, right? I mean, that's still a, fun a question that you can ask that has some value, right? Uh, with decision-making, though, we're really asking how questions, right? How can we do something better? How can we play a better game of Go, right? With classification, you have ground truth. So you um, take a bunch of images, you use Mechanical Turk, or you call up your friends, if, you know, if they're still your friends, and you say, hey, can you please label some more images? And uh, they say, yes, there's a hot dog, there isn't a hot dog, and then you build this system, and you have hot dog, not hot dog, right? If I take one of the images that one of my friends said was a hot dog, and I feed it back through the system, I, would, I should hope it, say, it should say hot dog. Right? I mean, there could be some noise, but if, if half the items are mislabeled, uh, it's not going to work, right? Um, but in the case of, let's say, Computer Go, right, we don't have a perfect Computer Go player, right? And if we have humans playing Go, we want to do better than them, right? So, um, in fact, if we had a perfect Go player, we could do imitation learning, which is a form of classification. We can say, here's a board, okay, perfect player, what are you going to do? And we can train some neural network to do the same thing, right? Where it becomes decision making is where we want to go beyond what we have in sort of our data set. And that means the way we evaluate is going to be completely different. We're gonna do what's called counterfactual evaluation. 
So what that means is we're going to use a variety of different statistical methods to try to intuit whether this system is better and how it is better. Right? But we're never going to know completely until we actually deploy it and do an A-B test. So as I said, I've been doing recommender systems for about a decade, and they all seem to follow this formula to some degree. So I tried to sort of formalize how things are recommended to people in sort of a pretty agnostic and holistic way, right? Typically, we have some set of action features. So if you think about YouTube, for example, it might be the features describing that particular video. And if I choose to recommend one video or another, they're going to have a different set of features, right? That's what's going to cause us to choose, choose one video or another. We also have a set of context features. So for example, I might be somebody who watches a ton of videos, and knowing that will help to absorb some of that signal, right? I might be on iPhone, and people on iPhone might, you might click on more ads than people on Android. And so having that context, again, will absorb some of that signal, right? Um, there's session features, which I'll get to a little bit later. And then there's these event predictors. These are the things I talked about, the probability of click, like, things like that. So, so typically, you come up with a set of these kind of very immediate events that are hopefully correlated to you know, the, the, the goals of the business, right? And you're going to try to you know, learn that, those signals, right? Um, there'll be some value function. This is everything from, you know, it could be constructed by hand. It could be as simple as, uh, and I'll use Amazon since I have no idea what they're doing, but they could say probability of click times 10, probability of conversion times 100, add those two together, bang, we're gonna rank by that. Right? But the point of the value function is to take all this information and crush it down to just one number so that you can sort. Right? Um, the control function is really interesting. You might think, if I have a great value function, I should just choose one, two, three in order and show them one, two, three. And that's true, but you don't have a great value function because there's always new content. There's always irreducible noise. And so we actually have to do something better than just choosing the, the top items every time. Um, once you've chosen an item, then you'll transition to sort of a new state. That state is the, is the session with that item already fixed at the top. And now you're going to choose the next item. So for example, if I choose a basketball um, to recommend as, as an item I want to sell, the next item probably shouldn't be another basketball. Because given the prior that you've, you've passed the basketball, you probably don't want to see another one. Right? And so, that XS prime there is going to contain sort of the rules that will, or the data that will eventually build our diversity rules. So maybe XS prime says how many basketballs I've already shown. And if that's one, then you know, basketballs are out, right? So notice that all of these other functions take in XS. So your probability of click on, on the basketball, given we've already shown you three basketballs, is going to be much lower. Right. Oh, go ahead. Sure. I'm sure you're going to get into this, but how is recommendation as I wish. I mean, if I had complete control of the environment, all of you would be clicking ads right now. And I'd be in Hawaii, right? But yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, yeah, that's, it's a really good question. So the question is kind of, how is a recommender system you know, a control problem, right? Um, I think, yeah, this is a bit of an inversion from traditional control. In this case, you know, Facebook in this case is the agent. So, so the, the Facebook system that chooses how to sort things, that's the self-driving car. But the, the people who are on the site, 
the people who are buying the basketball or buying the, the vacuum or anything like that, that's sort of your reward. You can't really control that, but you can control showing one thing versus another. And that's the thing that's sort of running autonomously. Does that make sense? OK, cool. Oh, yeah. If you, OK, so the question is, if you have enough data, um, you think about that. But I think that's true for any control problem, right? So if you have, if you have enough information and you know the, the you know, causality of any of these decisions and you know it to, to any horizon, then you would do, then you'd do imitation learning. Um, oh, you're saying the, so the question was like the, as the sequence gets kind of shorter, then maybe the, the problem becomes more amenable to supervised learning. It's possible, it's possible. But I think you know, we've definitely seen over the years that, that there are issues with these feedback loops. So like the example I gave of sort of gaming that related uh, apps, right? That's, that's a real thing that could be mitigated through control theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Um, so now the part of this, the part of this that's really the most interesting, or the, the, the part where you know we've sort of moved the problem to, or the interesting part of the problem is the value function, right? Um, there's a question of what what do we put there, right? What do we optimize for? What do we value? Right, and this is really an economic question. Like, we're not going to get around the economic and philosophical questions by using control theory or reinforcement learning. They're still going to be there, right? Um, and they're they're very difficult. They're very difficult functions to learn because they're not really differentiable. And also, you might not want to do the exploration necessary to get the entire landscape. So you know, what would happen if we filled the entire Google.com page with ads and you had to click to the next page to get any content? I mean, that's an interesting question, but the price for, for, for asking that question is really high, right? So, so there's going to be a lot of irreducible noise here. And typically, it works something like this. The value function tuning works something like this. I'm going to call this data scientist descent into madness. Um, you have these event predictors that are hopefully related to things that your company cares about, and you have to just try different functions, uh, each one resulting in a different policy, a different ranking. Um, and eventually you can kind of, uh, through black box, you know, through A-B testing, you can kind of climb your way to something more idyllic, right? Um, this is pretty difficult, so over time we learned to do better data scientist descent. This is where we've created functions that are parameterized. And so now we can, still using black box methods, using you know, grid search, Bayesian optimization, um, things like that, EA kind of methods, we can, we can uh, you know, find out the right set of parameters, the best set of parameters. And so now we're in the business of tweaking this, this function, but we're being aided by these black box methods. Right? Um, this is great, but it's still limited, right? Um, the black box methods will have some challenges around, let's say, um, you know, being contextual, right? If we wanted to have a different value function for each country, or if we wanted to have a different value function for each person, we have a lot of them on Facebook, right? That's going to be a really big challenge for search, right? Ideally, that, that's when you start getting into the realm of machine learning and function approximation and interpolation and things like that. So, you know, the hypothesis that we had about three years ago when we came together to build this was, you know, that we could use reinforcement learning to solve kind of this class of problems, right? And along with that hypothesis is the idea that a lot of these problems are sequential. So think about, uh, you know, marketing, for example, right? You get an email from Toyota saying, hey, we have a new truck, right? They don't necessarily care whether you click that email or not. Right? But they're sending you the email because you know, it's somehow related to, to correlated to buying trucks. 
right? So you can imagine this whole sequence. I mean, you get the email. Uh, you go to the Amazing Sharks game yesterday, and there's a Toyota banner on the, on the, on the boards, right? Um, you see your friends driving a Toyota, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, all of a sudden I want to buy a Toyota. I don't even know why, right? Um, and reinforcement learning is great at that sort of sequential nature where there's many, many pieces, and we have to sort of figure out what is the causality there among all of the, that, that whole chain of events, right? So I'll give a brief introduction to reinforcement learning. Um, fortunately, we don't have to have mice or cages or anything like that in the data center. We have mathematical approximations for all of this, so no mice were harmed in the making of Horizon. Um, but you can imagine it in terms of a mouse, where this mouse is in some maze, mouse is taking different actions, maybe you know, choosing different branches of the maze. At different parts in the maze, there's, there's reward. There's cheese. Um, the mouse sort of observes that reward. And then also, um, you know, in the case of model-based RL, um, which I'll talk to later, the mouse actually kind of builds an internal representation of this maze from its experience. So if you've ever worked on SLAM or one of these other methods, you kind of know about this, right? Um, just to kind of make it more formal, you can imagine this is sort of a Markov chain, right? So you have a state. The state encapsulates everything that I need to know about you know, the current environment. You could even put some historical information into the state to kind of make the problem Markovian. Um, we have our action. The action could also be some sort of context, such as the set of features of a video or something like that. The action could also be very discrete, you know, the buttons on a joystick or something like that. Um, after taking a state and action, you get a reward. Now, people have asked me in the past, why isn't there a line from the state to the action? And the answer is there doesn't have to be. In other words, you don't have to make a good action. You could take a totally random action that's uninformed. I mean, it's possible. Um, you get a reward, and then there's some transition. Right? Based on that state and action, you'll transition to the next state. What we're going to try to do is learn the best policy, which is another function that says, given a state and a list of actions, a list of alternatives, it's going to try and find the best one. Right? Um, and an episode is going to be sort of this chain that could go for infinity. I mean, Toyota is always going to keep trying to sell you that truck right, for your whole life. So that chain never ends. Um, but you know, there's games like Go and other things where, where uh, you know, it is finite. So getting back to our value function, so tying the reinforcement, uh, the recommender systems with this reinforcement learning, um, you know, a good value function would be this, which I've denoted as Q. Basically, let's take the sum of the future rewards that you're going to get, and let's try and learn that. Right? If we know that, then we can have a pretty good policy, which is you know, pick the best value. Right? Now, because some of these chains can go to infinity, and because the action has much more effect in the immediate term than the long term, we're going to introduce a gamma hyperparameter, which is going to be some value less than 1. And so gamma is going to you know, basically decay these rewards over time. So one thing that you know, is very intuitive, and, and uh, it's the first thing we did when we started building the system, is to just regress over the values. So for example, if I have 30 days of um, advertiser data, of ad impression data, then I can go back 30 days. I know exactly what's going to happen in the next 30 days. right? So I could just say, I was at this state. I chose this ad for this person. And here's what happened over the next 30 days. But there's a lot of irreducible noise there. right? I mean, this is not dependent on all of these other ads that they could have been looking at over those 30 days, right? And so it's going to be very, very difficult for some machine learning system to learn this, right? Here's sort of an example of why this is difficult. Um, my PhD was on computer Go, but I'm actually terrible at Go. But fortunately for everyone, I'm really good at tic-tac-toe. Um, I beat my son probably half the time at tic-tac-toe. So, um, Here's an example where you know, this person chose this action in the bottom left, O went there, X went top le uh, middle left. This is a pretty good move. I mean, maybe you should play in the middle. Uh, you know, it depends how old your son is. Maybe you don't want to play in the middle and let him win this one. But, but I would say this is a, this is a, a reasonable move. 
right? But then O plays there, and instead of winning the game, X chooses to play in the middle, and then O, let's say, goes on to win the game. So you can imagine if, if this was epoch one of training, this could be a kind of game that you see from your system, right? So what's going to happen here is all of the moves X made are going to be punished, right? But that's not necessarily very fair, right? I mean, that first move and the second move to a lesser degree, are not, they're not bad moves, right? It's really the third move that kind of costs the whole game. But if we just do value regression, that value is going to be low. All of those actions are going to get poor performance, right? And that's what we're trying to avoid with the credit assignment problem. Now, especially when you look at real world problems in industry, you're never going to get away from this, right? But there are certain techniques that are going to be better at handling this. Oh, there's a question. Yep. So in this case, is the state like a nine-length vector that encodes all the possible locations of x's and zeros? Yep. Yeah, so the question is, what would be the state for tic-tac-toe? And yeah, it's exactly the board state. And so you know, that's one interesting thing is, for, for a lot of the academic research and reinforcement learning, um, the state is very, is very transparent. And so even though the problems are extremely challenging um, because the reward, uh, the horizon is very long, the rewards are very sparse. So for example, in Go, you might make 100 moves before you get a reward, um, or even more. Um, but they don't have some of the problems that, that, that happen in industry, where the state is very opaque. Yeah, it's a good question. So I'll get to more of the details later, but, but so the question was, you know, would we use sort of a fixed length uh, state vector? And the answer is really anything goes. So you know, if you're familiar with a lot of deep learning, there's convolutional networks, um, there's things like BERT, there's LSTMs, there's a variety of different ways for handling different media. And, and deep reinforcement learning can take advantage of really all of them. Um, sometimes we'll, rely on, on unsupervised and some semi-supervised systems to sort of distill the feature space down for us so that we don't have to try to solve the whole thing end to end. Um, but you could if you wanted to, yeah. So SARS is, a, is going to be a better way of dealing with this credit assignment problem and learning, and learning uh, you know, more robust, safer policies, right? And the intuition here is if you look at value regression, if you were to take kind of everything to the right of gamma, right, you could actually substitute that with the value function again. Right? So you could, you could make this sort of a recurrence. Right? And that's, um, what that's going to do in practice is that's going to really smoothen out all of those features. So if you think back to the tic-tac-toe example, um, sure, that game didn't go that great for x. But there's probably other games where X was one step away from winning, where X went on to win. I mean, statistically, it's going to happen, right? And so all of those experiences are going to get sort of averaged together. And that's going to reduce some of the brittleness of value regression. Um, it's good, but we can do even better. The idea here is, if I'm going to ask my model and say, OK, value function, tell me what the value is of this action. If I'm going to rely on the model anyways, then why don't I just ask my model to pick the best action? Right? Like, why, why do I even really care what A of t plus 1 is right? if I'm going to ask the model anyways? And so that's what Q-learning is doing. So with Q-learning, we're going to iterate over all of the actions. We're going to choose the best value. And we're going to say, you know, in an optimistic way, if I take this action, this is, this is the best feature that I see. Right? And we're going to pick the action that has the best feature. Um, so it's a lot of hand waving here. There's a lot of theory that went into it. Um, but that's sort of intuitively what's going on. Um, and what we found in practice is that this, you know, it's also it's not a silver bullet. Once you introduce a ton of noise in the search in the state space, in the action space. Um, you, you, know, you can't always get the optimal policy for, all, for, for these reasons. But again, it's, things are much more fluid uh, once you introduce you know, deep learning and these kind of things. And what we found is Q-learning just in general outperforms SARSA on the problems that, that we're interested in. Um, the big weakness with Q-learning is that max A. If you have a million actions, then you also have a big problem. 
If you have a continuous action space, then you have an infinitely big problem. Um, and so we can move on to policy gradients. And so policy gradients is you know, trying to learn that max A as a separate function. So I'll have some function that takes in my state and does that max A computation in that network. And so now I have these two networks that are playing, playing against each other or, or complementing each other. All right, applying RL at scale. So, you know, when we started this, there was, um, there was AlphaGo, there was, um, you know, Elf OpenGo, um, OpenAI was doing some work. Um, that, was, that was pretty large scale. Um, but most of the reinforcement learning was, was, was relegated to sort of the, the robot control domain, where the number of free parameters is relatively small, right? The state space isn't in the millions or hundreds of millions. Uh, of free parameters. Um, also, a lot of these domains, even to this day, have simulators, but we don't have a Facebook simulator. Life would be a lot easier if we did. Um, and I'm pretty sure Amazon doesn't have an Amazon simulator either. Uh, you can have different approximations, but I mean, these are incredibly complicated emergent systems, right? It's gonna be very difficult to simulate them accurately, right? And we came with this hypothesis of you know, despite sort of these challenges, could we take a lot of this awesome technology and apply it to these kind of like historically very challenging but very rewarding problems? And after three years, we've had some, some really good success with this that I'll share with you all. So first I'll talk briefly about, you know, the things that were really important to us that, that over time we learned were, were, were sort of key elements to building the system. Um, one is that we're really limited in what we could do online. Um, and there's practical limitations there, right? I mean, imagine if you're a research scientist, but your code is adapting in real time, and then you know, the Olympics happen, and all of a sudden you get paged or something like that, or you get paged at four in the morning. And it's not a page like a machine went down. It's a page that, oh, the hyperplane has shifted, and you're like, what do I, oh my god, right? So we can't, really, we can't really work that way. So, so we have to do things in batch. We have to ingest huge volumes of data, train you know, extraordinarily complex policies that encapsulate so many different um, contexts, and then deploy these policies to thousands and thousands of machines. And we have to be able to do this in sort of the stepwise way. Um, we need a distributed training. We have petabytes of data. Um, and so, and so we, you know, we need to have a system that can handle that. Fortunately, PyTorch distributed is, is, is pretty great. Um, we need fixed policies. We can't, uh, um, again, we can't have online learning. That kind of stuff would just uh, make it very difficult for us to advance. And so Horizon kind of is able to sort of fill that niche. Um, also, we have this integration test. So um, you know, every day we, we play Pac-Man if Pac-Man gets eaten by the ghost, you know, someone gets a task associated to them saying, you know, what happened? The system is degraded. Um, and so you know, we use a lot of the classical RL methods to make sure the system is sane. Um, we deployed to thousands and thousands of machines. Um, because we're deploying static policies, you know, that, um, the, the, the team that handles that deployment, actually, they don't even necessarily care that it's a reinforcement learning system and not supervised learning. It's totally agnostic to that. Um, but but uh, you know, we need to handle extraordinarily large scale. I mean, there's billions of people interacting with these systems. Um, and we use Spark pretty heavily. So with almost any of these systems, um, you know, there's a component that's pretty CPU heavy, right? There's a lot of feature preprocessing, a lot of data sanitization. Um, there's a lot of normalization. I mean, you know, imagine in supervised learning, if you have a feature that has really wide range. Imagine it has a variance of you know, 10,000. It will blow up the model, right? Now imagine what happens when you take supervised learning and you make the label, the loss function, a function of that deep model, right? You just took that problem and you made it way harder. Because now if my model ever outputs something crazy, that's the ground truth, right? The next model is going to be, uh, the next iteration of that model is going to be evaluated on how well it can match that craziness. And so you can easily spiral out of control. Um, also, just in general, introducing nuisance variables 
It's a really big challenge for control systems and for reinforcement learning. This is something that people aren't really used to. You know, we used to think, oh, just throw more data at it. You know, put up the regularization, put up the dropout, um, and the, sh the more data you have, the better. That actually doesn't work. Um, the more data you have, the more ways a decision can kind of go wrong. And um, that's something that was actually really profound. So we've built a lot of technology around doing feature importance in the context of decision making, right? And uh, only choosing the most important features. All the training is uh, done on PyTorch. So we have something that takes the output of all of this, uh, uh, these Spark jobs and streams it into a set of servers with many GPUs that are all running you know, PyTorch distributed and chatting with each other. And our evaluation is all done using CPE, counterfactual policy evaluation. I mean, we log the um, you know, normalized entropy and these things, but they don't matter. Right? I mean, the system, if it can delude itself and it thinking it's doing great and it can match that greatness, you'll get extremely you know, numbers that, that look great to anyone who's done supervised learning. They'll be ecstatic. But then when you deploy the model, it's not very good. Right? Um, on the flip side, what CPE lets you do is it lets you actually say, if I deploy this model, I'm going to get 2% more clicks. And it's usually pretty accurate. And that's pretty powerful. That's something that people aren't really used to seeing. They're not used to seeing that, that, oh, this model, which I haven't even launched yet, haven't even done an A-B test, but I know plus or minus some epsilon that I'm going to get more or less utility from it, which is pretty powerful. Um, again, with a lot of these open AI environments, their state space is relatively small. Um, there's not that much irreducible noise in the environment. And so we can get within 3% of the true reward. So what we did in this case is we had a random policy. It just moves randomly, just crazy thing, right? We trained based off that data. So we just observed this random policy, trained one of our policies, and then we tried to guess how well our policy would do without running it using counterfactual policy evaluation. And we got within 3% of the true value. So when we ran it, we were very close to our guess, which for people who are trying to deploy things safely is very, very important. Right? Um, we've had a variety of different production launches. Um, almost all the notifications are powered by reinforcement learning. So hopefully you're getting few of those, fewer of those, uh, and they're more, they're more meaningful um, than, let's say, I don't know, three years ago, two years ago. Um, also, a lot of our infrastructure is looking into reinforcement learning, everything from uh, you know, data center management all the way to making sort of real-time infrastructure decisions. So for example, you're going into a tunnel. Uh, the system could kind of learn that and say, if your high quality video buffer is pretty large, then maybe you can tolerate that tunnel. But if you just started watching this video, then we'll start, we'll start sending low quality packets to you. That way there's no delay. Right? So a lot of these infrastructure problems are sequential decision making. Um, and of course, as we've been talking about, a lot of recommendation systems are sequential decision making. Uh, and so we, uh, we're actively involved in a lot of areas there as well. So finally, we open sourced everything. Um, we did it because we, uh, we run really fast, and so we don't feel like we're really losing any competitive advantage. We would rather have more people use it. Um, and we really want to sort of build a community around this because, as I said, a lot of us are very passionate about this and believe that this is sort of the next frontier, and we want to be a part of that. We want to be sort of the Hadoop, not the MapReduce that nobody knows about, right? Um, so you can go on here, you can train your own model. There's actually a, a walkthrough step-by-step -step on how to train it on some synthetic data. I encourage everyone to do that. Um, if there are any issues, file issues on GitHub. We're, we're, we're monitoring that pretty closely. Um, we're also releasing a lot of new technology for how to do reinforcement learning in a batch mode. We're actually gonna be changing the core RL algorithms and we have some research papers on that. Um, all of that is either in the open source already or it's going to be pretty soon. Um, finally, we have a decision serving platform for you know, kind of handling the serving of, of the model and implements Softmax, Thompson sampling, lets you swap out models quickly. Um, that is coming to open source as well. Um, so keep an eye on this. And 
That's what I got. If you have any questions or comments, I would be happy to answer them. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, so two, two things I want to ask were about, uh, you know how you said like the hacking space might be like millions and hundreds of millions? Or yeah. Yep, yep, totally. I was wondering um, what you thought about that. And then, like, uh, I also wanted to ask about, like, delayed reward, where you have this, like, discounted gamma function. But what if rewards in the future actually matter more than um, what is happening now? Yeah. Like, you're doing, like, inventory, and it's seasonal, and it depends on the time of day and things. So, yep. like, uh, yeah, those are both good questions. So I think, uh, so the first question is, how do you handle these huge action spaces, right? And... There's a lot of really interesting work around doing policy gradients plus KNN. So let's say you have a huge set of actions that are embedded in some space. You can have the policy net tell you, OK, what would the hypothetical, like perfect action look like in that space? And then if that doesn't exist, you just do a KNN and you choose those actions. And so there's a lot of really cool work on that from DeepMind, Google AI, and, and some stuff that's going to come out from us too. So. Yeah, um, the other question was, oh, what if the long-term rewards matter more? It's a good question. In general, tuning the reward function or the utility function is, is a huge challenge, right? Um, so I still think you need the gamma. Otherwise, a lot of the mathematics breaks down. But you could give really large reward to some of these sparse events. And that way, even if they're way down the line, if there's a chance of that, the system will kind of go for that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, sure. uh, hey, have you had a chance to look at the new TensorFlow Agents RL library? And if so, could you maybe compare and contrast them to Horizon? Sure, yeah. Um, I haven't looked at that one specifically, but I've seen you know, dopamine, I've seen OpenAI baselines, I've seen things like that. Um, again, I think the domain is totally different. And so we're less interested in, you know, advances to sort of the core DQN, and we're more interested in, think about, think about it like this. Um, think about like RMS prop, or eta delta, or these other sort of step functions. They were invented because the data is kind of noisy and correlated and things like that, right? So it's really like an industry problem that made its way into academia, right? Um, and so we have a lot of problems like that that we're trying to solve. And so my guess is that our system would probably look pretty different. and. Um, if you were to take our system and try and play Dota with it or Go, it would get blown out, right? But on the flip side, like we can handle sort of different domains that other systems would fall apart at. Yeah. Last question. So, so first off, we do the marketing for Toyota. So just, thank you. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Checks uh, but, in the mail. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so question for you. You know, in terms of recommender systems, is the time between actions gets longer and longer. At what point in time does that time between actions no longer is relevant for using a recommender system? You know, because a lot of things you're talking about are online spaces, which can be seconds or minutes. Can you just yep. talk a little it's bit about that? It's a good question. Yeah. yeah. So I think the answer there is that you have to have a good user model, right? Like, for example, like to use Toyota, Toyota as a, to continue with that example, if you had some measure of a person's valence, you know, of their propensity to buy a Toyota, and, and you could sort of increase their valence through showing an ad, even if um, it was sort of a probabilistic, stochastic. So maybe there's a chance if you show this ad, you can b boost their valence, right? Um, then the horizon doesn't necessarily matter. That person's sort of in this really excited state, right? Now, not everyone in that state will buy. There's still noise there. But you can think about it in this really long-term uh, environment like that. But you need a really solid user profile to, to pull that off, right? Without that, then you're right that it will be more about the short-term context. So it's really about how you can model the problem and what sort of noise there is, temporal noise there is there. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Cool. Thanks a lot. I'll be here if anyone has any other questions.